Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's V Brown Bag. We've uh, got a great show tonight. We're going to have Eric Santillis talk about uh, AWS certified sysops deployment and provisioning. Uh, so we're continuing the series about the uh, certified sysops associate exam, and uh, he's got some great uh, information for us. But uh, first, a little housekeeping. Uh, we want you to be interactive and speak with us. Uh, we will be monitoring Twitter with the hashtag vbrownbag and at vbrownbag as our Twitter handle. Um, and my name is Tom Green. I will be the host for the evening, and I'm joined with uh, the great Ariel Sanchez Mora. Uh, say hi, Ariel. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm actually, I actually think you're you're greater, you're nicer, and Eric Santelises, he's the best. <laughs> yes. Thanks, guys. I was certainly saving the best for last. I was going to uh, to introduce Eric. He's a uh, AWS expert from uh, from Round Tower, so we expect some great things coming from our uh, uh, presentation tonight. And Ariel's going to be monitoring Twitter, and we'll take your questions. If you have one, just uh, be sure to put it into the interface or tweet it to us, and we will uh, certainly interrupt and ask. Uh, so with all that said, uh, Eric, I'm going to give you control and let you take over. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, it looks good to me. All right. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Sanalisis. As uh, Tom was mentioning, um, tonight I'm going to be covering the AWS Certified SysOps Associate Domain Number 4, which is around deployment and provisioning. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at underscore digital roadies. And uh, just a brief background about myself. Um, I've, I'm a naturally born uh, sysadmin. Um, I've been working in enterprise IT since uh, 1998, um, working at large corporations, uh, scaling and deploying infrastructure. And so, you know, uh, being asked to, to sit on this panel and talk about, you know, the, the certified sysops uh, associate uh, exam was very timely because I'm actually going through my Amazon certifications. And my next certification is the sysops uh, certification. So, uh, Without further ado, let's just dry, dive right into this. So here are some of my uh, exam tips. Um, I've already taken two of the associate exams, the developer and the architect. Um, and so one of the things that I've realized in, in prepping for the exams and, and uh, studying all the material is that, you know, we all know following Amazon that they have, you know, thousands of releases a year um, in their products. Some of them are major uh, product announcements. Some of them are minor product announcements. But one of the things that, that I've been troubled with is keeping up with all of the latest announcements because it's part of my job um, and understanding all the capabilities that Amazon has to offer um, is, is knowing the point in time and the context of the question and the exam, uh, you know, and, and the time frame of that exam. Um, I know that a lot of the exams are going through revisions at this point. Um, it looks like Amazon's beta testing some additional questions for the sysops, I'm sorry, for the architect associate, because um, as of today, there is a discount. Uh, if you take the advanced, it has an additional 20 questions. So they're constantly updating the exams, but all the content that I'm going to be pre presenting today is going to be based upon what's in the exams as of this moment in time. Um, so the, the other uh, tip that I have here is, you know, the exam is as much of a reading comprehension exam as it is a technical exam. So, so really you have to understand what Amazon is asking you or what AWS is asking you um, in the context of the question. Um, as you read through the answers, um, you'll find some answers that are, that I call like the way out answers, which they could be perfectly valid solutions but in the context of the question or in the context of what they're asking for, they just don't make any sense. And I have an example of one of these that I'll show you uh, as we go through the deck. Um, something else to think about when you're going through, you may find two answers um, that both satisf satisfy the requirements 
Um, what I would recommend doing is going back through um, some of the questions are formatted so that you have a lot of content up front and then it's a simple one or two line question. Go back and reread that one or two line question after you reread all the answers and find the answer that's most right um, because chances are that's the one that they're looking for. Um, I'm sure all the other presenters before me have mentioned this is, uh, you know, and this is a key to, to being successful on the exams, um, is, is do the quick labs and, you know, get hands-on experience, you know, with the, with the trial accounts and, you know, the, you can get online and, you know, if you sign up for Amazon uh, uh, webinars, they give out credits for use that you can use uh, on Amazon. So get some hands-on experience, even if it's just for your own uh, blog or for your own uh, use but get some hands-on experience out there. Um, and of course, you know, read the FAQs for each of this, the, the domains that you're gonna be uh, covering uh, in your exam, and then read as many of the white papers as you can that apply to the, to the exam, in this case for the SysOps exam. So domain four, um, what are the objectives here? Um, domain four from the SysOps uh, uh, exam, blueprint is 15% of your overall score. And the, according to the blueprint, the primary focus is, uh, you know, being able to demonstrate the ability to build the environment to conform with architectural design. And the second objective here is to demonstrate the ability to provision cloud resources and manage implementation automation. So what does that look like? Um, you know, to me, uh, when, when, when I was going through the, the, the preparations for this, and in my ongoing uh, studying, it kind of boils down to three buckets. It's ops work, it's cloud formation and elastic beanstalk. And so jumping right in, um, you know, elastic load balancing, ELBs. So uh, remember I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, you, you, we have to understand the context here and, and what's being tested on. Um, from, from the channels that I follow on Slack and the people that I've spoken to, no one has seen questions yet on the application load balancing but yet they've seen, you know, the primary content is around classic load balancing. So uh, classic load balancing, think of it, it's a, a, a layer four type load balancer. And the supported protocols are uh, standard HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, and SSL. And these are important because when you're going through the exam, you're gonna see questions where they're asking about classic load balancing and whether or not you can do uh, internal load balancers on specified ports. So uh, just keep in mind that if you're running um, EC2 Classic, you have a, a more limited set of ports that you can uh, use. But if you're running standard EC2 instances in a VPC, then you can use the full range of TCP ports um, in, in this load balancer configuration. Something else um, that you're gonna come across is around um, health checks and the health of the instances behind the load balancer. And in all of my reading and all of my preparation for this exam, um, this seems to be the biggest one. So I, I've chosen to focus on it uh, for the next couple of slides here. And so um, get very familiar with the load balancer, get very familiar with creating and configuring health checks, um, setting up a, stamp, a sample uh, website one of the things that uh, you know you may want to do is just create a, a default index.html with like a hello world in it, and then play around with standing up the web server and taking down the web server and validating that the advanced details that these healthy thresholds and unhealthy thresholds are being met, um, and and that the site is being uh, the server is being put into service and taken out of service accordingly. Um, one of the things that trips you up on the exam is to, uh, is the first thing is this ping path that's listed here. Um, ping path is the actual page that you're gonna interrogate on your server. Um, by default, this is the default configuration. It's a forward slash index.html. But if you're running like a WordPress site or you're running uh, some PHP or Node.js, that may not be your default uh, index page. So you need to make sure that you update that. Uh, the other thing that um, you need to understand is the way that the math works around the advanced details. So the interval is the, the, the period that's, that the web server is being checked. So in this case, the default is 30 seconds. The healthy threshold are the number of checks that have to pass in order for that service, server to be put into service. So in this case, we have an interval of 30 seconds and we have a healthy threshold of 
10. So it's going to take five minutes. It's going to take uh, all 10 checks over the five minutes every 30 seconds for this server to become healthy before it gets put into service. Now, conversely, on the unhealthy threshold, keep in mind that we have a response time out of five seconds. So every 30 seconds, we're going to check the web server. We're going to check for an index.html page, and we're going to make sure that we get an OK200 response from that web page. If the web server is not responding within five minutes, we're going to check the unhealthy threshold and increment that by one. After 30 uh, seconds come, go by, we're going to go back and do another uh, uh, get on that index.html page. Again, if it takes over five seconds to respond, or if it doesn't respond at all, we're going to set that flag of unhealthy record is going to increment by one. So now we're at two. So the web server is going to be taken out of the load balancer at this point. Now, it'll continue to check the web server. But again, in order for it to become healthy and for in order for it to be put back into the the, the load balancing group, um, it needs to pass 10 checks. So this is something that, you know, Amazon will, will throw some questions at you that are phrased a little weird um, or will actually force you to do the math to figure out how long it will take for that web server to become available again uh, in that server pool. Um, another question or, or a couple of other uh, metrics that come up quite a bit on the exam in different various forms are around uh, uh, surge queue length, uh, spillover count, and latency. So you'll see questions on the exam uh, such as, um, how, how, do, how do you know when uh, there are, there's a, a large uh, number of requests that have been unfulfilled? And so, you know, the answer for that could be your surge queue length um, because those, those, those requests have come from the users. The load balancer has them. It sent them back to the web server, but the web server hasn't responded. Uh, and so the way to, to measure that is through this search queue length. Um, spillover count. Um, these are pending requests uh, for the instance as well. And the, so these two come up in combination typically on the, on the questions on the exam. And then latency is uh, the amount of time after the request leaves the load balancer, gets to your server, your EC2 instance, and then has received a response from the EC2 instance. And that's the latency measure there. So going back to the health check uh, previously, if your average latency is four milliseconds, or four seconds, I'm sorry, um, then if, you're, if your latency is set to five, uh, I'm sorry, if, you're, if your response time is set to five, um, and then, you know, if you know by watching the latency metric that your response time is four seconds, then, you know, you may want to change that five to maybe a seven or an eight uh, to, to give your, your application enough time to respond when it's under heavy load. So um, moving on, there, there's... Um, there's a couple of different uh, session, uh, sticky, sticky sessions that are supported by classic load balancing. And so um, there's two different cookie types. There's the load balancer generated cookie. And this session cookie is managed by the elastic load balancer and requires an expiration period when you're configuring it. And so um, in this particular scenario, um, when traffic comes in from the end users, it hits the load balancer the load balancer is going to pick one of the servers that's available in the server farm and send that user to that web server. Let's say it's web server number three or application server number three. From there on forward, every single request from that user, as long as the cookie has not expired, will go back to web server number three or application server number three. And that's the first type of, of cookie. The second cookie is the application generated cookie. And this is where you get to control the cookie and all the expiration periods and all the uh, val values that are inside of that cookie. Um, when you configure this setting, um, the cookies are managed uh, by you, but it requires the name of the cookie so that the load balancer can interrogate that cookie every time it sees it with every request that's coming back to ensure that the traffic is routed to the appropriate web server or app server going forward. So you'll see questions um, in the exam such that um, 
you know, you, you have a, a server farm with, you know, four or five servers, um, an auto scaling group uh, was initiated. It added two more machines to the group, um, but yet those two new machines are in service, but there's no traffic going to them. What could be the problem? Or, you know, why is this happening? And so the answer would be is that you're using some type of cookie that has not expired and that's why traffic is still being routed to those uh, to those older machines and not to the newer machines yet. Another question that comes up quite a bit on the exam is around um, pre-warming of the elastic load balancer. And so um, this is actually a feature that Amazon offers today. Uh, when I started with Amazon back in 2009, um, working for a software as a service company, there was they did not have this capability, and we we figured out uh, after you know several software releases and maintenance uh, windows that when our applications would come back online, they would be very slow in responses, um, and this was due to the to the load balancer because we were down for four, five, six hours, uh, the elastic load balancer just wasn't serving, um, you know, wasn't able to handle the traffic that we were getting. And so we, we figured out a method to use, you know, some, some scripting and, and kind of do our own pre-warming of the load balancers. Um, but just keep in mind, as you're going through the exam, there will be some questions around pre-warming the load balancer. Um, you know, typically it's around response times are slow after a sudden uh, surge of traffic. Um, and so, you know, that's going to have to be, you know, the answer to that is around, you know, uh, pre-warming of, of the environment. And so if you plan on doing load testing for Amazon uh, on your Amazon platform, you can send an email to them, tell them when you're going to do this load testing, tell them what your expected traffic is going to be, and they'll pre-warm this, this, uh, the, the load balancers for you. And basically what pre-warming really is, is that it, it's scaling out that, it, that uh, load balancer infrastructure uh, to meet the maximum capacity that you're expecting. And so that can happen organically, but when you get these flash spikes, um, that's where you're going to see, um, you know, this, these problems occur. And so um, when I was also, uh, when I was with that, uh, so that software as a service company, um, we, we had a, a TV, uh, we had a customer who wanted us to host a site for them uh, for, you know, a TV campaign. And so, you know, with the nature of, of TV commercials, we didn't know when those commercials were going to air. We didn't know, uh, you know, exactly you know, when we were going to get these these flashes in traffic. So, you know, that's when we were using uh, that pre-warming where we did it ourselves. Um, but that's the perfect kind of use case that you would want to expect, uh, that where you don't expect that, that sudden spike in traffic. Um, you know, you'd let Amazon know that you're going to have this traffic spike over these days or these weeks uh, while that TV ad is running. So um, here's one of the questions uh, that, that you can see. Um, I took this from the sample questions that are on Amazon site. And so let's just go through this and, and talk through it and, and see which is the best answer. Um, your, web sir, your website is hosted on 10 EC2 instances in five regions around the globe with two instances per region. How could you configure your site to maintain availability with minimum downtime if one of the five regions was to lose network connectivity for an extended period of time? And so let's look at the first answer. Um, create an elastic load balancer. Okay, yeah, great. Um, that's what we've been talking about. Uh, let's place it in front of our EC2 instances. Okay, that's the proper use of that technology. And let's set the appropriate, appropriate health check on each load balancer. And so when we read through this, and then we take this answer and compare it against the, the actual requirements, right? Um, you know, I don't think this, this this answer uh, satisfies uh, the requirements because they're saying we're going to have uh, five regions, right? So this, if, if, if it was a single region, yeah, I, I would agree that's, that's a good answer. Um, but because we are talking about multi-regions, um, I don't think it's going to be the best answer. And so um, let's go ahead and, sorry about that, let's go ahead and read the second one. Establish a VPN connection uh, between the instances in each region. Rely on BGP to fail over in the case of a region uh, a region-wide connectivity outage. Okay, well, um, this is one of those way out answers, and so immediately I'm going to mark this one as, as you know, not a valid answer, right? Um, and, and so why would we not choose this answer um, or, or this approach? Well, because Amazon's handling the, the multi-site uh, network connectivity for us, right? That's, that's something that 
that they're doing. Uh, we just consume services in the five different regions. So we, we don't have any reason to set up BGP because we're not managing those network connections between those sites, right? That's an Amazon function. Uh, moving on uh, to the third one. So create a Route 53 latency-based routing record set that resolves to an elastic load balancer in each region and sets an appropriate health check on each load balancer. Okay, that's more plausible than the first answer. So because that answer is a plausible answer, I'm gonna go ahead and say answer A is out of the question here. Um, it is not a valid response, I should say. Um, and then let's move on to, to, the, to the last one here, and that's create a Route 53 latency-based routing record set that resolves to elastic load balancers in each region and has evaluated target health flag set to true. Okay, now what do I do? I've got two answers that are potentially both candidates uh, to satisfy the requirements and, and both seem plausible um, in, in, as, a, as a solution. So let's go ahead and dissect this a little bit more. And I don't have my images. Are you guys seeing diagrams on your screen? No, 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 we are not. Maybe press, you know, continue. Maybe it's on, on the continue side. No, uh, it's not on D. All right, let's break out. Image currently cannot be displayed, but it's over here. Awesome. Oh, my God, look at that. The demo gods have failed. <laughs> what about copy paste into paint? Try that. Oh, let's see. Let's, let me nice. go back to version number two and see if this one works. Yeah. That works. All right. Um, this is exactly why I didn't want to do a live demo, right? Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so so here we, we are. We back back if we didn't have something like this, trust me. <laughs> yeah, I know. So here we are with answer C, and so in this case, we're using uh, you know the ever famous example.com, and so this is what happens um, when when a request comes into the load balancer. Um, it hits the load balancer in this particular region. And uh, you know, subsequently we could have uh, another region here. Uh, this one happens to be Southeast Asia Pacific. Requests would come in, um, evaluate target health is set to no. Okay, so what happens here? Um, we, we get this, this weighted record set and then we, we look at the, the server and it says failed. And then we go to the second server and it's failed. So our traffic basically just fails. Uh, the the you know the the end user experience here is hey they just got a 404 page not found or they got uh, you know unable to resolve or some other you know weird error that is not delivering what the content uh, to the customer was desired. Um, but yet customers over here in 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 the southeast are are happily chug, chugging along, and you know they're able to get to the site and everything's great. So if we go back to the question, and so, you know, you know, minimum downtime if one of the regions was to lose network connectivity for an extended period of time, right? So as we go forward, you know, C does make sense, right? But, you know, how do we control traffic if, if this one is down? How do we ensure that, you know, our users are con consistently getting uh, to, to healthy pages and, and being rerouted around uh, this failed traffic? So here's, uh, example number uh, the the diagram for for number D or answer D and you can see we're going our queries coming in again for for example.com our latency alias record set uh, is there and so we already know because evaluated target health is set to yes we already know that back here we have failed instances so because we failed these instances because of our health check um, this region is no longer in service so what's gonna happen is we're gonna try this way. No, nope, we can't get in there. We're gonna try this way. Nope, that one's failed also. So that what are we gonna do? We're gonna route that consumer to another region and route around the failed traffic. So the answer for this question, uh, the best answer for this question is gonna be D because it satisfies all the requirements. It allows us to route around a failed region and allows us to continue to serve our application or our website. So I'm gonna take a, Brief uh, sip of water here. Hey, Eric, we got a no got a question for you here. Uh, going back with ELB, uh, when you're using one of those load balancers, do you just do it mainly for like websites, or can you put any other sort of application behind an, 
elastic load balancer. I, I know you showed some of the examples for configuring one, but I was hoping you could drill in just a little bit deeper for that. Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and so the answer is yes. In classic load balancer, you can serve, um, because you have a range of ports that are available um, when you're running in a VPC, you can, you can put anything behind a load balancer um, as long as you can maintain the state within your application um, of, of, or, or if it's stateless, right? And so those are application dependent uh, requirements. But from a load balancer perspective, it's not uncommon to have an external load balancer uh, for let's say your websites and then you have an internal load balancer uh, or an external load balancer for your web servers and an internal load balancer for your application servers, right? Both groups would be horizontally scalable. And then when your web servers go to interrogate the application server, rather than hitting app server 01 or app server 02, they're actually hitting the elastic load balancer address to uh, service those internal applications. Your external web server could be running on port 80 or 443, standard web ports. Your internal applications can be running on 8080, 8443, or any there, any combination they're like. Oh, great, thank you. It's perfect. All right, so moving on, um, OpsWorks. So, so what is OpsWorks? Um, again, going back to you know my first bullet point about um, taking the exam um, and understanding the context here. Chef Automate was just announced uh, at uh, reInvent. 2016 back in November. And so the, the SysOps exam obviously predates that. And as of this morning, I could not find any evidence that Chef Automate was, uh, there were any questions regarding Chef Automate um, on the exam as, as of now. So um, for, for purposes of this, uh, this talk, I'm gonna focus on um, OpsWorks stacks versus the Chef Automate OpsWorks. And so what's the difference between Chef Automate versus Chef Stacks? Um, Chef Automate is a fully provisioned uh, Chef server, um, fully licensed, so you pay uh, by the hour for the Chef software, and you have underlying access to the operating system that Chef runs on. And you can deploy all your cookbooks to it and your recipes, and you can do all the great things that you can do with standard Chef but Amazon maintains it um, kind of like RDS style where they'll do the updates and patching for you of the, uh, of the Chef Automate server and the licensing's included. Um, OpsWorks uh, Stacks is their original implementation of a Chef server on Amazon. Uh, and so, you know, the interface is, is, is pretty different. And so let's just dive right into that. Um, so OpsWorks Stacks benefits um, will support any op application it will uh, configure your environment as code. It allows you to automate and to run at scale. And it also has resource organization. And so what does this all mean? Um, so, so basically, you may have seen this uh, before. This is taken from uh, Amazon's FAQs, uh, this diagram here on the left. And so this is a, a standard uh, you know, multi-tiered environment. And and so um, in this particular diagram here on the left, um, the load balancer would be one tier, your application servers would be another tier. And notice, you know, we have the, the three dots here, right? So that means that it'll continue to scale as we have uh, demand. And then on the back end, we have our database server. And so rather than going in and actually configuring all of these tiers and configuring all of these elements uh, manually through, um, through you know, the various interfaces for you know, EC2 load balancing, your app server, RDS, if we're using RDS on the back end for the database server, we can do all of this through OpsWorks stacks. Um, we, it handles package installations, it handles database connection strings, um, passing them through as parameters to, to the EC2 instances. Um, it'll automatically scale based on time or load. Um, we have the ability to create permissions and policies um, so that we can set up uh, a, a policy that, uh, like let's say our database use, our database admin could only manage the database tier, uh, whereas the sysadmins could manage you know, the entire stack. Um, so it's based on Chef, and so when you're deploying uh, these, these application servers, um, the Chef client will actually get installed on those machines, and the interactions between uh, uh, the web interface and the servers are, are using that Chef client, so you can check your standard logs. 
And so um, something that's important to kind of understand is, is the context here. What we're looking at here from, a, from holistically is called a stack. Each one of these components in here is called layer. So this is a layer for the load balancers. This is our application server layer, and this would be our database layer. And so what does it look like when we're configuring this? Um, this here is a stack that I created, um, you know, when I mentioned before that we had a, a TV campaign uh, that was running uh, at, at one of the companies that I worked at. We never knew when we were gonna get traffic spikes. So we used OpsWorks, uh, you know, for this, for this campaign to, to manage the infrastructure for us. And so you can see here, our stack name is set up as uh, you know, dinner and moving. Um, our region was in North Carolina. We have our VPC name, our subnet that we're de default subnet that we're deploying into, uh, the version of operating system. Because we wanted to be as immutable and po as possible, we did not apply uh, SSH keys uh, to this environment. And then you can see here the version of Chef that we were using. And again, this is a hosted Chef. So. Um, we didn't actually have access to the server, but if we were going to write cookbooks uh, to be executed locally on the server, this would be the version that we would have to be compliant against. Um, in this particular example, we, we are not using um, uh, custom cookbooks, um, but uh, in, when we did actually deploy this, I, I went back and I recreated this from my notes that I had when we built it out. Um, but when we actually did deploy it, we did use custom cookbooks um, on the server. And then you have the ability to choose a color for your stack. Um, what the purpose of the colors are, I don't know, but you know, I thought red was cool, so I chose red. And then moving on, um, looking at the the advanced options. So um, you know, on the previous page, there's a little drop down for advanced options. When you drill down into it, um, you can see here uh, that we chose to use instance storage. And again, I told you we were trying to do uh, immutable infrastructure, so we didn't want people logging into the servers to check logs and things like that. So, you know, the way that we were able to address that is um, we we assigned an IAM, IAM role to the to the server um, and and the services that were being built, and that was called S3 access. And then, as our application uh, got deployed onto the server, um, one of the things that it would do is periodically pick up the logs and then drop them on S3. Uh, using the command line tools. And so um, you, you, you know, I know we've, this has probably been covered previously, but um, when you assign a role to, to an instance uh, such that this role is called S3 access, uh, you can use your CLI tools without passing in uh, username and password in order to uh, uh, you know, access other resources within Amazon because you are using that role. And so, uh, you know, when, when all of this is said and done, basically you hit your, your ad stack and Amazon goes off and starts doing its thing. Um, the next thing that you have is, is, is the, the ability to create a layer within uh, the, the stack, right? And so when I was showing you the picture before, the entire stack is the load balancer, it's the app servers, and it was the database server. This here is a screenshot where we were creating our Node.js application we're specifying the version of Node.js. And in this particular instance, um, we had not created the Elastic Load Balancer yet. Um, but you know, Amazon gives you a quick link here that you can click on, takes you right to the EC2 page to create the load balancer, and then you can simply flip back. This will update, and then you can choose the drop down to pick your, your load balancer. Now, this is for the app server. You can see here, Node.js app server. And so once I clicked Add Layer, um, we went back in and we were able to create another layer. Now, at this point, we are creating our load balancers. And in this particular uh, case, we were using HAProxy. And so HAProxy is a layer for load balancing built in. Um, we also enabled our statistics and set uh, the options here for those statistics uh, for the load balancer. So now we have two layers. And uh, you know, because uh, creating an RDS instance takes a long time, I wanted this to be a live demo, but in, in, uh, uh, to, to make sure that we save time and that we were able to get through every, all the content, I went ahead and I pre-baked this a little bit. And so you can see here, we have uh, our RDS instance dinner and movie created, and there's one application tied to it. <clears throat> here you can see when we built out our Node.js servers, we have three instances. 
And from our HA proxy, we have two um, load balancers in our load balancing group. Now, if we wanted to add an additional layer, it's as easy as clicking down here, adding an additional layer, or clicking up top here on the right-hand side and adding a new layer. And when we drill down and we actually look at that application, you can see that we're not actually deployed because again, I was recreating this from my notes, um, but we would have a last deployment date for this application stack. Here you can see the application name, the type, um, the, the data source. And so this is the database that we had back here, dinner and a movie, it's an RDS database. And then uh, we can simply come in and edit, we can delete or we can deploy. And so this is what it looks like. Um, again, this is not actually running. You can see the, the, the overlay here. Uh, this is the entire stack view. So the, the stack name, once again, was a dinner and movie. You can see we have five instances here and they're all stopped, but if they were running or online or they were still being configured, you'd see the, um, you know, the status of each one of these here. Um, if they go into error, you'll see them, uh, it'll be enumerated here as well. And then you can see our application stack. And then coming down here, you can see the resources that we have in use, which is our RDS instance. And so one of the things that you'll find um, as you go through the exams is that um, you may see something like, uh, you, you know, you deleted a, a, an OpsWorks stack and you found, um, you know, uh, in your VPC that you had security groups that still persisted even though the stack is not there. Um, you, you know, something phrased along those lines. Um, just keep in mind that these security groups do not get cleaned up. Um, when you tear down a stack, they, they will linger behind and you need to come in and actually manually clean them out. Um, otherwise, you know, it'll get really ugly really fast if you don't, uh, you know, maintain this and keep it groomed. So any questions before I move on? So yeah, for those um, security groups, does it always keep the name similar to what you named your stack? So, so uh, good question. Um, I didn't expand the group name, but what ends up happening is that from a security group perspective, it will take um, and concatenate, you know, AWS OpsWorks, and then like in this case, you know, Flow Ruby, and it will take a, a portion of the stack name as well as a portion of the VPC name and create a, um, a like a GUID, right? So you understand what the group name is because it has part of the description in it, but then the GUID is what's unique and then it will continue to apply that. And that's what's linked back to the actual stack. Does that make sense, Tom? Yeah, yeah, totally. I just was just curious so, how that uh, group name got generated. Yeah, so if I were to deploy three versions of this stack, I would get these security groups here times three, but they would all be unique. First off, because they'd have unique group IDs, but the group names would also be unique because it's gonna use that concatenated uh, st stack name and, um, and VPC information. Just as long as it's really hard to delete uh, the wrong one. That's all <laughs> that I care about with this sort of stuff. Well, um, deleting the actual security groups, if they're in use, it's kind of like EBS volumes. If you try to delete an EBS volume that's in use, it's going to throw up an error. It's going to let you click the delete button, but then at the end it will throw an error and say, can't delete this volume, it's already in use. And the same thing happens with stacks. As a matter of fact, when I was trying to clean this up today, um, it looks like all the resources had not been purged when I initially clicked through and, and, and chose all these to be deleted it actually gave me an error saying that these four were uh, still in use. And then I, those four were still selected. I hit delete again and it says, these two are still in use. And I did it one more time and then they were all gone. Um, so so they, there is some level of protection in there for you, right? So you just can't delete something uh, that, that may still be in use. Thank goodness AWS is smarter than us. Yes, yeah. I, I always panic when I go to delete EBS volumes, even though I know they're not attached and I know they're not in use. I always, I always have that pucker feeling when I when I hit that delete button. 
All right, so moving on, um, CloudFormation. Um, and, and, and so this is, you know, the, the, the one that's, that's, we can spend probably the next, you know, five or six or seven or 10 V brown bags talking about because this is such a huge uh, topic. Um, you know, everything is moving towards CloudFormation. And so what is CloudFormation? Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, basically at its core, it's, it's uh, you know, infrastructure as code, right? And so, you know, what does that really look like, right? Um, you know, and when when I was uh, on the customer side, you know, I worked with a lot with the developers and, you know, during our agile planning and, and sprints and, you know, we would all sit down and talk about this design and the app dev team uh, would go off and start writing their application code. And then, you know, if it, us infrastructure guys would go run back and and sit down and start hammering out virtual machines and creating load balancers and, you know, doing all this stuff by hand. Well, you know, in today's world uh, with, with cloud formation, we go back to our desks and we sit down and we start writing templates, right? So we start writing code. Um, and so the thought process here is that, you know, we, we take our design, the developers do their thing, we do our thing, and then we merge them back together and create what's called a stack. And then we deploy that stack, we conversion that stack, and, and so we start treating our infrastructure the same way as uh, the developers treat their code. As, as we have new requests or we, we discover new dependencies or we have uh, new artifacts that, that need to be accounted for, um, we come back in and we continue to update our code. We check it into a source code repository per best practice. We create a new stack and then we deploy. Um, and then you know, ultimately we go back and we iterate, right? So we keep doing this process over and over again until we get it just right. So um, you may be asking yourself, you know, how is CloudFormation different than Elastic Beanstalk? And, and so I went to Amazon's, you know, FAQ and I pulled this down, right? Um, because Elastic Beanstalk does kind of some of the same things. But really when you, when you take a look at how Amazon defines it here, um, you know, these, these services are designed to complement each other, right? And, and so Elastic Beanstalk actually uh, it, it leverages uh, cloud formation in the back end, right? As a, as a provisioning me mechanism for the resources that are defined within Elastic Beanstalk. And so um, Elastic Beanstalk, you know, really is, is the developer's view of building and deploying applications. Uh, so without getting, you know, like the sysadmins or the sysops, uh, DevOps folks involved, um, uh, a, a developer can use Elastic Beanstalk, um, install the, the appropriate, you know, components into their IDE and build and deploy infrastructure. Um, and so that's different from CloudFormation because CloudFormation actually gives us a lot more control over all of the Amazon services where Elastic Beanstalk is just a subset of them. And so like OpsWorks, um, you know, you have uh, the, 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 this notion of a stack um, and, you know, the, in CloudFormation, a stack is a grouping of infrastructure. Um, you have a template and a template is a JSON document um, that's given to CloudFormation with instructions on how to act, how to create, uh, you know, what it is that we're looking to create. And then, um, you know, just, just a note here is that a template can be used to create and or update a stack. So, you, so again, going back to that infrastructure as code methodology, we can increment our um, template version number, which will then create a new, a new stack for us because we've changed that version number. It's a new entity. Um, and, you know, again, I want to go back to, you know, my, my comments in the beginning of this um, talking about the JSON document uh, uh, regarding a JSON document. Um, Amazon has recently rolled out the ability to create templates for cloud formation in YAML. But again, I have not seen any evidence or heard of anybody who has seen any questions related to YAML on the exam just yet. So again, this is one of those point in time uh, question, you know, uh, test taking uh, scenarios where um, just understand that you know, if there's a question around what languages does CloudFormation support, JSON's the default language as of, uh, you know, today for the, for the exam purposes. And then ultimately, um, you know, we have here uh, stack policies. Um, stack policies are IAM styled policies, which governs what can be changed and by who. So similar to OpsWorks, we can delegate uh, capabilities uh, for 
DBAs or for application teams to be able to go in and edit or, or use certain components that are built um, by CloudFormation by using stack, uh, stack policies. Stack pol uh, and, and then also important to note, and this is uh, actually on the exam, is that um, policies cannot be removed, but they can be updated after they are created. So what's the, uh, what is the anatomy of, of cloud formation? Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is, this comes up on the exam as well um, in different formats, um, but basically um, what you need to really understand is that the only resource, or the only thing that you need to create a cloud formation um, a template is, is, is a resource, that's it, just one resource. Um, and that will satisfy cloud formation and allow you to build and deploy. Um, but there are uh, other capabilities such as parameters, which allows the passing of variables into templates. Um, we have mappings, which allows you to process hashes. And then we have outputs. So uh, one thing that, that becomes really, really powerful with these capabilities is that you can start layering cloud formation templates. It's as opposed to building a single monolithic template, you can create a bunch of smaller templates and then take the outputs of one template and feed that as inputs or as parameters into other templates. And so I have some examples I wanna go through. And as I mentioned before, our most basic CloudFormation template, um, this is our hello world. Uh, you know, we're gonna create an S3 bucket on CloudFormation and we're calling it hello bucket. And you can see here, it's a resource. The name is hello bucket. Our type is an AWS S3 bucket. And so if we were to build and deploy this on CloudFormation, we'd get a success and everything's happy and we have a bucket out there called Hello Bucket. And so, you know, let's get a little fancy here, right? Um, and so let's add some properties. Um, so pretty much we have the same resource before Hello Bucket. Um, we're going to add a, a type of AWS uh, uh, S3 bucket. And now we're going to, we're going to, add on to that and create some properties called access control and we're going to give it public read. And so we upload this to CloudFormation, execute it and you know things are happy, everything's working. So uh, real quick to interrupt the with the JSON format is something I've always wondered is it required to have the kind of ascending or descending brackets to close it or is that just a standard that people like because it looks makes it easy to read and looks nice um you know that's a really good question uh i use atom as my um development environment and it does auto indenting for me when i'm working with json um so i'm i don't i'm not 100 percent certain i i can tell you that it's not an exam question they're not going to ask if you know everything is left blocked is it going to work um, but but this from a from a description uh, perspective, you know you have uh, you know the steps so that you can understand you know how things are nested right um, and and where they belong together. So from a from a visualization perspective, it, it makes a lot more sense to visualize it this way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I've, I've just always wondered why it was intended that way. So that's pretty cool. Thanks. And so moving on, um, you know, we talked about mappings a little bit. And so this is kind of where the real power of CloudFormation comes in. So uh, let's say, for example, I'm using uh, uh, Amazon's uh, um, AMI for Amazon Linux. And I want to deploy that in US East 1, US West 1, EU 1, AP Southeast 1, and AP Northeast 1. But that AMI image is different in each one of these areas, in each one of these regions. So how would I go about deploying an Amazon instance in these regions without having to go in and hard code these values, right? And so that's where, you know, this, this mappings comes in. And so when we look at mappings, you can see here that we're specifying a mapping, we're calling it region map. And then in region map, we're creating this key value pair of US East one, and then the AMI uh, uh, def declaration here uh, showing the AMI instance ID. 
And then we're, we're enumerating that for each one of the regions that we wanna uh, build and deploy this to. And so when we get down to our resources, um, you can see that we're deploying an EC2 instance. It's of type AWS EC2 instance. And the properties that we're gonna feed it are a key name, a reference, and then a, uh, a key name again. And so the instance ID, we're gonna use this function here called find in map. And this is why I said we can probably have the next uh, 10 V brown bags on cloud formation alone, um, because one of the, the, the concepts that uh, cloud formations allows us to use are, are these abilities to do lookups um, and, and these functions. And so um, this, is, this find in key map is a function that's built by Amazon um, and so all we have to do is just call it find in key map. We're specifying our region map, and then we're specifying our reference, and then our AWS region. And we're specifying that as an AMI. And then we're passing a piece of user data in here. And so uh, all user data that, that is passed in to our instances has to be in base 64. Um, and so we're calling another function here called function base 64 and we're passing in a uh, user data of 80. And so for display purposes, I didn't uh, close out these brackets properly there, Tom. So, but this would compile and this would work on CloudFormation if we were to try to uh, run this today. Yep, and there's the uh, base 64. And so another sample question uh, regarding CloudFormation. So an administrator is using Amazon CloudFormation to deploy a three-tiered web, web application that consists of a web tier, an application tier, that will utilize Amazon DynamoDB for storage. When creating the CloudFormation template, which of the following would allow the application instance to the database tables without exposing API credentials? And so, as we read through these, um, you know, immediately we can strike B out because you know, uh, B is is stating that we can use a parameter section to interactively allow the user to input access keys and secret keys. Well, that, you know, we, we don't want anyone to know what those keys are, right? So according to the requirements. Um, so, you know, immediately we're gonna, you know, that's one of those way out answers, right? So let's throw that one away. Um, you know, as we continue to move through this, uh, created an identity and access management user in the CloudFormation template that has permission to read and write from the required DynamoDB table, use the get attribute function to retrieve the access and the secret keys and pass them to the applications instance through user data. So, um, you know, if, if you've taken previous exams or you've, you've, you've studied for, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Amazon associate exam, or even the professional exam uh, architect, um, you know, we know that once you're on a box or you've used Amazon, right? Once you're on a box, you can interrogate the user data. So, you know, letter C is, is not a valid answer. Um, and so the last one here we have is, you know, create an identity and access management role that has the required permissions to read and write from the required DynamoDB table and reference the role in the instance profile property of the instance. And so, you know, the, the correct answer here, um, because it's it's the most right answer, right? And and I did mention, again, going back to my my, my tip, uh, tips for taking exams, right? Which is the most right answer that satisfies the question. Um, in this particular case, it is answer D, because it does keep the security uh, uh, keys and access keys uh, confidential, and uh, no one has access to them by assigning that role to the instance. So any questions before I before we get to summary? Uh, I haven't seen any come in through the, the console, Ariel. Do you have any off of uh, social media? No. no. Uh, you know, some people tweeted stuff, and but not re no real questions. I think you did a great job. All right. So so just to wrap things up, um, you know, re remember the time frame for the questions on the exam. And you know, I, I showed you a couple of exams uh, questions, um, you know, that uh, that we went through from different scenarios. Um, none of them specifically were, you know, um, you know, had these had some of those so, trickery answers in there. Um, but uh, you know, just keep that in mind. 
um, you know, when you're going through the answers, you know, get rid of those way out answers. It, it, you know, it, it's one of the ways that you can get through, you know, when you have four or five answers and, you know, uh, or three or four answers that seem plausible, you can get those, get those, you know, the, the way out questions out of the way and focus in on, on those other three or two uh, questions to, to find the right one. Um, you know, use the free tier and get hands-on uh, with with Amazon, right? So, so practice is is the best way to to get through this. Um, you know, and and you know, try the different technologies out. You know, go create some some cloud formation stacks, create some ops work stacks, and and you know, kind of go through and, and get some experience there. Um, if you if you you know, again, read the white papers. Uh, I know they're boring. I know they're long. Uh, and, and, you know, as you go through them, you'll be like, you know, this, these things just don't make sense. But as you start using uh, Amazon more and more and you start getting into these uh, different uh, uh, aspects, uh, when you go back and you reread those white papers, you're like, oh, now I really understand what that meant because you've actually done it in practice, right? Um, you know, read the Cloud CloudFormation FAQ, you know, review the OpsWorks FAQ. But be focused on, uh, you know, stacks versus the the the, uh, the full blown uh, uh, chef implementation, and then uh, read the classic load balancer FAQ. And and last but not least, you know, thank you very much. Uh, keep calm and good luck. Well, thank you very much, Eric. That was fantastic. Uh, really appreciate all the work and the the information you gave us there. Sure, my Love pleasure, Tom. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, that marks the end of our show. So uh, thank you all for watching.